Aloha, everyone. Take your time to see everybody. I can't do that. Hope everybody is well. Or good enough. We can begin by sensing, feeling, knowing our current posture. Sitting on a cushion, on a couch, on a chair, standing. And any movements the body makes as it settles in when you take a few deeper breaths and then feel the energy of the breath, fill the body. And then what happens is the body kind of drop in in certain areas, the upper body, lower body, just all the parts kind of coming together into a unified nature sense. The Buddha spoke often of just knowing our posture, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. It can be the springboard for a huge unbroken stream of mindful awareness. And then the awareness of when that continuity ceases, when the mind veers off, and just gently collecting it again. So as we begin to practice together, just check if there is a nearby Brahma Vihara to add to the intention the motivation for practicing at this at this time in this moment so intention with kindness the profound wish for your own welfare and the welfare for all beings Or maybe it is compassion that is connecting with some distress, uncertainty, or the unknowable, and just caring for that somewhat weighty emotion. With the, the emphasis on the care, and the care becoming part of our mindful continuity of awareness, feeling the posture and when it feels right, making the whole body your anchor or the breath as it's experienced 
in the abdomen rising and falling or the chest expanding, contracting, or some combination of the body and sound vibrations. And maybe it's mudita, the Brahma Vihara that's close at hand to add to or intention and motivation for practicing now and just feeling that joy enter into the mind stream. Appreciation of just having this time to practice together. Appreciation for our well-being and others' well-being and happiness. Maybe that profound balance, equipoise, mental equipoise, the stream of mind that is stilled by equanimity, that still point of non-reactivity. Pleasant arises, unpleasant arises, neutral experience, all arises. But when that upeka quality is present, the mind, heart is unperturbed. It sees, it feels, it knows, it just isn't reactive. So let one or more of those qualities become part of the mindful awareness as you feel the body from within the body, not from the head or filtered through thoughts. Or you feel the whole cycle of the breath, the fullness of a rising movement of the abdomen or expansion of the chest or upper ribs. And then the softness, relieving, relaxing sensations without breath and the chest cavity reverses from expansion to contraction or the abdomen gently flows downward with similar correlating sensations that are softer, smoother, lighter qualities of touch sensation, temperature, subtler vibration. And doing that a few times and frequently, frequently checking on the quality of the mindfulness colored by one or more of the Brahma Viharas that have a soothing affect of the awareness continuity. And what you discover, what you notice about other phenomena in the body, other sensations or areas that present themselves effortlessly in the portal of awareness, or when thoughts call the mind away, just seizing on that moment to understand that having the heart-mind that we do, that is the sense for making thought formations or for attunement to thought formations. Just as when we're aware of the ear sensitivity picking up sound vibrations, so the heart sensitivity picks up thought and emotional vibrations. And we collect the awareness around that function of mental thinking arising. And they make the effort to stay anchored in the mind sensitivity itself 
rather than being pulled into uh, the sequence of thoughts that weave themselves into a story when we're not paying attention, that we identify and attach to. And then it might be some moments before we're aware of the thinking mind of that particular thought formational sequence or emotion that it captures the attention until we notice that that is happening and then just see what happens to it. Neither, neither pushing it away or holding on to it. If we become skilled at, at one sense door, the body sensitivity, the ear sensitivity, any of the sense door sensitivities, the more we're skilled at one, there's a natural overflow into the others that make the six sense door awareness practice much more tenable much more effortless and then quite naturally as in a symphony in different sections of the sound event or events of a symphony is sometimes it's the sensations that are in the foreground sometimes the sound vibrations sometimes visual imagery sometimes the narrative that we are recollecting, are projecting. Appreciating that this Dhamma nature to uphold means that the phenomena are following their own, all the phenomena are following their own nature. The elemental nature we experience with body, sounds, light, fragrance, and taste. And the elemental nature of mental formations in the form of thoughts and memories and ideas, and imagination. And this is as if we're watching various film strips pass through taking our time, like light footsteps. So mindfulness is receiving the imprints of physicality and mentality in the form of the elemental natures and sounds, light, all entering the body as they do. Recognizing all of these things happening within ourselves. They're everything that we can know. All of the gods, karma, dhammas, heavens and hells, they're all inside, they're all within us. There's nowhere out there to seek for what's real, what is the immediate felt sense reality, which every time mindfulness touches that, a little more attachment is peeled away. A, a little more looseness of our system, system arises. Less clinging, less pushing away, and more centeredness, more just abiding in the middle The body as the body, and the mind as the mind. Just see for yourself what's true.
Thank you for the instruction, Stephen. Beautiful. Mm. I had an interesting experience just before uh, the sitting started, um, getting, getting ready. Uh, I turned on my computer and uh, the sound worked, but the picture didn't work. And I thought it was really interesting. It was just the screen. My screen was all black. Um, uh, and I thought, oh, I finally disappeared. <laughs> I finally disappeared completely. It was really kind of a fun feeling for a minute, but then I switched to a very old little iPad. So I hope you can hear me okay. And is it okay? You can see me and okay. Great. Um, There's a, a contemporary poet of ours who died recently. His name was Galway Cannell. And this is just a very short uh, quotation from one of his book of poems, The Book of Nightmares. He said, can we bless or at least not curse everything that struggles to stay alive on this planet. And it's such an interesting question. Yeah. Do we can ask ourselves, can we bless or at least not curse everything, everything that struggles to stay alive on this planet? And, and you can kind of expand that to include your thoughts, right? The pleasant, unpleasant, neutral thoughts, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral emotions, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral body sensations, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral smells, tastes. It's like um, all beings, all appearances, can we bless or at least not curse? And I had a, a incredible teacher from India named Deepama, who um, I felt really had this kind of metta or loving kindness so developed. It was uh, truly unconditional. You know, uh, loving kindness metta is unconditional love without conditions. And it was um, really wonderful to just be with her and be, just see how she lived. And the way she lived was almost like, a, um, other than when she was sitting, uh, an incredible offering of blessing. And it wasn't like she was picking and choosing a bee or a dog or this human or that human or, you know, she, she, would, she knew people better than other people and had people she was closer to than other people, of course, as a human being. But the quality of the loving kindness was the same for whatever appeared in her moment to moment life. And it really felt like a, a blessing, but also something she gave. It, it was like an offering. Very inspiring to um, see that that's possible, that that's possible for us as human beings, if we keep at it. And I, I think that we have to have a lot of patience with that process. You know, the, the, um, the ways in which we get annoyed or frustrated or angry with how things are, disappointed, um, how this unfolding of pleasant, unpleasant and neutral appear karmically in our world, um, that this, um, maybe some humor 
and patience is, is very important. I was at the farmer's market about a half an hour from my home uh, a few weeks ago. And I happened to um, have to park right as you drive in to this place. And this place is like open fields. Um, but the, the, to get in, you have to go through one narrow place where uh, it's a dirt road and a lot of potholes. So it starts um, with you know grassy areas, but this dirt road that has a lot of potholes and bumps. Uh, so I was parked right there for the first time, right as you drive in. And I had gotten a snack and I was leaning against my car watching the cars drive in. And I had never noticed it before, but there was this pothole, really large pothole right at the beginning of this entrance um, with a huge puddle in it, but there was plenty of space to go around it, like plenty of space to go around it. So it's <laughs> very wide, <laughs> even though you, everyone has to go through this place to park. Um, so I was sitting there watching like not one car missed it. Like not, not one human being that drove through there didn't hit the pothole and all this water splashed and like got irritated and in the car, of course, it's not good for the car. And I was like, kind of flabbergasted, like that not one person missed it. And um, it got to be funny. Like it, it just got to be funny to me. And I just even stood there longer, just kind of in awe of like, us human beings collectively, <laughs> like how we can even, how did that even happen that not one person saw it and went around it? And then um, a week later, I did it. <laughs> I, I was also flabbergasted that I did it. I was like, how could I do that? Like I saw so many people drive through and I couldn't believe they did it. And then I did it. You know, and I feel like that's kind of something that in terms of like samsara and being on the planet and making the same mistakes, like and being kind of um, we can either really get down on ourselves and others or just get how hard it is to totally wake up and be free, you know, and I think that um, I'm really glad I. I didn't go around it because it's humbling. And I think it's really important to be humble and have humor about like how patient we have to be with this process. So that um, particularly like in the, the instruction, we get that sense that the real truth the real reality is spaceless and timeless and without boundaries. Yet at the same time, living in the human world, we have this internal world of greed, hatred, and delusion that we're dealing with that's so painful. And there's this outer world of greed, hatred, delusion in the human world that can be so painful, which are a kind of unhealthy boundary in the face of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, right? They're boundaries. And so um, I think from the perspective when we are really accessing the truth of how things are, the Dhamma, um, like in my story about the pothole and the puddle, it's astonishing sometimes how much people are needing to put up that protective barrier of greed or protective barrier of or defense of hatred or dislike or hate or the protective barrier of fear or delusion um, and that that protection just starts to get more encrusted like a barnacle that there's even these inward crumbling boundaries um, but that we end up in this like we end up in this kind of small dark room with no windows. <laughs> it's like isolated and alienated and so separate, whether it's despair or hopelessness or anger at how things are.
And it's possible like that equanimity that Steve mentioned in the instruction, like that being in the center, in the middle of things, connected but not trying to control that, 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 that deep understanding that's possible, just like with the possibility of the blessing of what's appearing in the world, that, that, that we have this possibility of deep wisdom, of understanding the truth of things, anicca, dukkha, anatta. But it requires, on, you know, it requires an understanding that we take birth in this world, where in this human world, uh, where we take birth in this sense, the six sensitivities, the sensitivity of the eye door, the ear door, the doors, you know, the nose door, the, the mouth door, the, the whole body, you know, our skin and all the organs and bones and blood inside, et cetera, the body door the mind door, and it, it's just, um, it's so amazing that with each moment of contact at one of the six sense doors of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, that there's a pleasant, unpleasant, neutral mental feeling that arises spontaneously every moment that we have no control over this, this, this samsara of like pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, so we, we don't have to even believe in life, birth, death, samsara. We can just see it moment by moment, birth, death, birth, death, of a sight, a sound, a smell, a taste. And if we're identified with it, if we think it's a me or a mine or an I, that boundary that we put up in the face of it uh, to protect ourselves, we're out of touch with the truth of how things are. So that, that, that shift in the meditation practice of shifting to just being with things as they are connected, but not trying to manipulate, fix, right, control, is such a huge shift out of the need to protect, out of the defense of, that we learn of greed, hatred, and delusion. So we see that if something, oh, sorry, if something pleasant um, appears and then we like it, we hold on to it. When it disappears, that, that we suffer and we don't explore how do we get imprisoned by the object of the wanting. We get imprisoned by the object of our desire. And that is a, um, it's a defense that is a kind of, it makes us feel separate. We're wanting to feel more connected with the pleasant, but actually the pleasant has passed and we suffer. And just like with the unpleasant, when the pain or the unpleasant appears and we, we go to push it away, just in that place of withdrawing from it with fear or pushing away, you can feel there's that sense of not being in harmony with the truth of things of how to, we might pull back from the projection, just like we pull back from the projection with the wanting, with the object, or we pull back from the object of the fear or the object of the disliking. And we, we, we experience the pleasant, unpleasant. And then we have this choice. We have a choice of how to respond rather than with aversion or fear or desire or attachment, we have a choice to maybe respond with compassion or forgiveness. There's so many, there's so many positive ways we can respond in this world, right? With quiet or calm, right? Or joy. We know all the possibilities with courage. So with the, this, um, with the staying in the middle of things, this equanimity, it's actually very vulnerable. It's, it's very vulnerable. The heart is open. It's not closed off with the defense. It's, it's open to this change of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. It's open and connected with this range of joy and sorrow and sensitivity at the six sense doors moment by moment. And this, the, the heart 
mind and the whole body is affected by this peace, this unconditional acceptance of how things are. But at some point, when we're in that kind of open, vulnerable, connected place that is so at peace, sometimes something painful can happen inwardly or outwardly, and we're so open and sensitive, sensitive. And when that equanimity disappears, it's almost like it's unbearable. We've, we've gone from being totally accepting and open, right, and feeling free, and then we might really react even to a thought that we have, right? We don't like thinking, you know, and it's, we don't like thinking itself or something, right? It doesn't take much. It, we might see something in the news, or we might, somebody might not smile at us when we're walking, whatever, whatever it is, but it's, it's like that, um, exquisite vulnerability sometimes we don't see that shift and we have we actually have aversion to being vulnerable and it's so beautiful when we start to see that oh we start to to uh, miss we miss the hidden object there we miss that all that's happened is that we're disliking being so open and sometimes all, all we need at that point is to take care of our own heart. Sometimes we get stuck in the aversion. Sometimes we might numb out with a difference. But we can learn, we can learn to be with that by taking care of our, our heart, the heart mind, with metta, karuna, mudita, upeka. And it's not, I'm not saying that we demonize numbing out or aversion or attachment delusion that's not the point we don't we don't push away or reject these defenses that are part of like being caught in samsara it's more we learn to what <laughs> that's what we're teaching to understand how to work with them to understand to understand And we all have our pace with this. Uh, Henry David Thoreau wrote July 19th, 1851. I like to quote from Thoreau's Wildflower Journal because it's so much fun to think of him around right this time writing this. Methinks my seasons revolve more slowly than those of nature. I am differently timed. I am contented. This rapid revolution of nature, even of nature in me, why should it hurry me? Let a person step to the music which they hear, however measured. Is it important that I should mature as soon as an apple tree? Yea, as soon as an oak? Ah, we all are going at our own pace spiritually. Pablo Neruda in the book of questions said to a turtle, or he's, at, he's thinking about a turtle. He said, how do I tell the turtle that I am slower than he? <laughs> how do I tell a turtle that I'm slower than he? Relationship, relationship. How do I tell the carnations that I'm grateful to their fragrance? Neruda said. So we can be at war with greed, hatred, and delusion. There's this immensity of unnecessary suffering that we face on this planet, immensity of unnes and unnecessary suffering. There's plenty of suffering that just goes with being on the planet and being human, the dukkha. But we have to respect that we can have in our heart center the just the sadness of heart at this unnecessary suffering. And the, the practice is to, 
is really the Brahma Viharas there, knowing that we don't have to drown in that pain or sadness, but the awareness can open up around it, finding it there's not doesn't have to be a boundary with it. We can the metta can open around it, the compassion open around it, right? That this is this awareness can open around it and then sometimes can can drop into it and infuse that pain in the heart with metta, kindness, care, equanimity, peace. And we see like when we attempt to do loving kindness sometimes for ourselves or others that we're having trouble with we forget sometimes we always need reminding that it's not the it's not the person but it's the behavior that we're disliking or even we're hating sometimes it's it's behavior that's motivated by greed hatred and delusion yeah that we're at war with that that it's harmful behavior that we do ourselves or others and it's really a question of war or peace can we find that relationship with the greed, hatred, and delusion in ourselves and others with wisdom and Brahma Vihara, finding that peace with it rather than taking it personally, we, we get interested in it so that we really get interested in the roots of war. We get interested in the roots of peace. And, and ultimately, that is taking responsibility for being born as a human and living out our lives. It's like we take responsibility for where we harm ourselves or others, where we harm, even in very subtle ways with the when we don't when we're not interested in the greed, hatred and delusion that's motivating our behavior. I wonder if you can see me if I stand up. Yeah, you can see. Uh, my mother, my mother died when I was about thirteen, and in that time afterwards, I used to visit her grave in Framingham, Massachusetts, a lot. Uh, it, it's, her grave was in a beautiful area of the forest, really peaceful and quiet. But um, my dad and my older sister had never been to the grave. And when my dad um, was just about to fall and die, you know, die two months after the fall. Um, the weekend before the fall, it's very interesting. He asked my sister and I to come, my older sister and I, and come and visit my mom's grave. So it was so um, almost thrilling to me that he wanted to do that. And I was in Massachusetts and uh, my older sister came and I bought flowers that my mother liked and, I, and Brian brought some trowels and uh, we headed there and we got in the cemetery and it's a big old cemetery, really big. Uh, and my father couldn't find the grave. So I knew where it was and I said, dad, it, it's you go this way, it's over there. And he couldn't handle it. He couldn't handle that I knew where it was and he didn't, but I didn't understand that. I couldn't understand that he couldn't handle that. I, I was giving him a direction and knew where it was. And um, he kept trying to find it and got lost and more lost. And I kept trying to show him where it was. And he got so angry at me that he put the car in reverse once and he knocked over a grave. And then 
I'm like, dad, it, it's just over there. You, it's easy. It's over there. And he, he got so mad. He put the car again in drive and he knocked over another grave. And I'm like, and my sister, who uh, was an alcoholic most of her life, she was drinking at that point. She had a bottle in the car. She was just glugging. Every time he hit a grave, she was glugging the, the wine down. And I'm like, oh my God. And, and then my father um, was so angry. And I just, I lost it. I just fell back into my childhood. I said, my voice got really like young. And I, I said, go ahead, Dad. Go ahead, Dad. Knock over another grave. <laughs> and my father just hit, the, hit the, the drive again, put it in drive, and he hit another grave. And I'm like, go ahead, Dad. Hit another grave. And it was so horrible. It was such a nightmare. It was one of my worst moments in my later adult life. And I vowed to myself, I was just like, it was so painful. And I vowed to myself, I would never lose it with my dad again. Like I just, this was so old a pattern of him being hostile and me being finally hitting the roof and being hostile back. Um, so I would say that was kind of a low point. <laughs> Call that a low point. And then uh, a week later, my dad fell, it's a long story, two months in the hospital, and he was in so much physical pain. Uh, and as I get older, I start to understand how hard that is and um, how grumpy you can get and how um, difficult it is. But he was really uh, in, in kind of pain that would take so much morphine to help. Um, and eventually, hospice called all of my family. I, I was there every day and asked us all to come in to have a meeting. And I'm like, oh boy, this should be interesting because there's like uh, born agains in my family, born agains, Baptists, atheists, agnostic, like Catholics. And then there's one Buddhist, right? Like and we're a huge group so in a circle This and this doctor, hospice doctor, sat us all down and um, it just was very quiet for a while. And then he said, does anyone have anything they want to say? And my family is not the type for this sort of thing. I just have to say this was a one, one off in our lifetimes. Uh, and so my sister just started sobbing and just sobbing with grief. And she said, I just, can't understand why my dad is suffering so much. Why has he had to suffer so much? And then she kept sobbing and she said, she pleaded with the doctor. She's like, please tell me, like, why did my dad have to suffer so much? And then she was kind of just softly crying and he waited for a while. And then it was just so quiet. And he said, Three words, he got born. And it was so stunning. My family all took it in. They heard it like it was so well done. And it was so true. It was so true. There was nothing that could refute it. Like it was true, that simplicity of the truth he got born. It only took three words. And in a family that I can tell you could never be seen as coming together and doing a good job at talking about what next st steps to take to my dad, it was just like so, um, this, this wasn't like a meta blessing. It was this deep wisdom truth that just came up into the family. And everyone cooperated. Everybody was quiet. Everybody was peaceful. Um, it was pretty amazing for me to go from two months before such a low point to such a magnificent shift. And I'm not saying that that lasted in my family, but it's not to be minimized. It's like everybody took in something so true 
and so powerful. And later the, the doctor took me to side and he said, um, I just want you to know I'm a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner. <laughs> And it was really a sweet, sweet to, he didn't say it to my family. That wouldn't have helped, but it's just really beautiful. So this equanimity being in the middle of things, it's like we have these times in our life that are so difficult and then so magnificent. And being able to hold both of those with this deep peace, this, this being with things as they are, so important. And it's, it's like, there's this deep, invisible well of pure Dhamma. There's a deep, invisible well of pure Dharma in this sensitivity, in this heart sensitivity of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and saying, smelling, tasting, touching, within that, inside it, is this deep invisible well of pure Dhamma. And this is that all we need is already inside of us. And when we understand that, there's this deep reassurance. It's like no one had to say anything at that moment he got born, but there was this deep reassurance of being connected with the truth beyond birth and death. And this is so important to, to know. Last week, um, Jesse talked about Mara and there was a question about Mara and I wanted to um, just remind us all that what we came to in the discussion was that Mara tries to tempt us with the greed, hatred, and delusion because he doesn't want us to leave samsara, right? That he's tempted, he's wanting to tempt us into samsara more and more because he's lonely. And that's what a, a Sayadaw, Sayadaw Jayanto, the happy, um, the angel Sayadaw in Burma, when I asked him about Mara, and he was telling me about Mara's family tree, he's known to be a deva, uh, and all the cousins and sisters and aunts and grandparents and grandkids and all that, I forgot to say something very important, so I wanted to say it, that um, Mara and the Buddha were related in past lives, and that's why the Seda was describing the family tree, because he was, he was describing where way back in other lifetimes, <laughs> the Buddha and, and Mara were related. And I think this is what we often don't hear in a modern, um, often Western, but just modern life in the Buddhist world that um, there's a whole other way to relate to these things, which is very relational. It's like, the Buddha didn't have a, it wasn't easy to be the Buddha, like his cousin tried to kill him. Think about that. Has your cousin tried to kill you? Probably not. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's a pretty hard world, right? And, but like, there was a family tree. Devadatta was a, and related to the Buddha. This is what I love about these old teachings is that it, it's really important to see that it's all relational and it's relational with our thoughts and it's relational with our sounds and sights and smells and tastes and all of it is like um, everything that's appearing is karma unfolded. And the Buddha taught us that everyone we meet has been our mother at some point. That's so relational. Everyone has been a daughter or a grandparent, or it's like, that's how, when you look at one of the most ancient of trees and you see all the roots and all the branches, it's like what we're born into is so deeply interconnected. And it can seem maybe complex, but actually what's said is that all we have to do is show up for the present moment unfolding 
That's the only way we can can get free. We can't delay it till five years from now. And then I'm going to practice with the emotion of shame or the emotion of fear. Or, oh, I'm going to put it off. I'll put it off. I'll put it off. I'll put it off. I'm going to get enlightened in the future. But we can't. It doesn't happen like that. It can only happen when we have the courage and the patience to be with things as they are in the moment and to make space for the neutral, to make a lot of space for the neutral that appears because we're missing that calm and we're missing that ease. We're missing that low drama or lack of drama. We're thinking it needs to be more intense. We miss the energy that can come from being calmer and quieter and more peaceful and making space for the joy, making more space for the simple joys of just sitting on a stoop. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to sit, sit on the curb and just watch cars go by. And it was so amazing, you know? I just, I think we forget that often joy is so simple. It's not a complicated thing we have to go after. You just stand watch the water come out of the faucet of your sink that's like very amazing to know that water comes out of the faucet of our sink we take it for granted but actually it's most people on the planet don't have that they have to go far to carry it Someone um, shared with me recently a friend that uh, they had just seen a, the new Leonard Cohen movie, which was mostly about his song, Hallelujah. And uh, she wrote me that um, he wrote 150 stanzas before he was satisfied with a few stanzas that remained. It, it took him seven years to write the song. And so the inch, one of the interviewers asked him what he had learned from writing his songs. And he said, um, failure and perseverance. And I think this is so hard for us to remember that we can be learning that, we can be learning by going through things over and over again, that, that we learn that it takes these two things, they go hand in hand, that the perseverance and the failure um, is what allows us to learn and to grow. So, so it's so important um, that, that I often read this quotation, um, it's about, the book is about the uh, divine mother archetype. And it, it's, it's the, um, the metta, the loving kindness is like um, really a genuine true love. It's like a, metta is a genuine true love. It's, it's unconditional. It's not romantic love. It's not attached love. It's not naivete. It's not sentimentality. It's not nostalgia. And all those, all those are okay experiences. It's not, again, we don't demonize them. We don't push them away. It's, it's just that they aren't metta. <laughs> metta is a, a genuine true love that is infused with wisdom that's how it can be without conditions that how that's how it can be boundless but we can't expect it to always be boundless right but we're limited and so sometimes it's not a perfect metta sometimes we like one neighbor and maybe not the other neighbor we might like this part of ourselves but not another part of ourselves but we start to see that we can work on that a little bit and then maybe go to the easy being or what's easy in ourselves or focus on the blessing of someone else that's easy right like we keep learning how to be flexible and not expect 
perfection. So this quotation, I, I read this a lot to myself in my life. Um, Sybil, Ber Sybil Bernstein Urri said, again and again, we learn, again and again, we learn that it is precisely the mistakes we make and the difficulties we experience, which force us to develop in ways that we would not otherwise have chosen. This is so important. If we can't see that, that we're human, that we're here to learn, and so that failure and perseverance, we keep we keep working it, working it until we actually can feel metta for fear, or we can feel metta for some person that's behavior is so unacceptable. And this is how we, how we change, how we transform. We go from being maybe ignorant and naive to really becoming more mature and needing less drama right? We need less drama to learn. We can go, oh, the mature response is to go, oh, <laughs> that was motivated by greed. Oh, that was motivated by fear. It's okay. It's, um, it, it was harmful to me or others. Maybe we said something that wasn't kind, whatever it is. It's like, instead of shifting into self-hatred, which doesn't help us learn, it just reinforces the identity of self-hatred. It identify it reinforces samsara, right? It reinforces this old conditioning rather than being able to have a choice to actually change our relationship. We're changing our relationship with fear. We're changing the relationship with thoughts. We're changing the relationship to the same old stuff that's appearing. We're not getting rid of what's appearing. We're changing our awareness of it. it. It's so beautiful. We don't have to worry so much about what's appearing. We have to keep being concerned about how we're, the awareness is in relationship to it. That's how we mature. It's that courage to find that genuine understanding, the genuine wisdom of ourselves and others' nature, the nature of how we are. Okay. Okay, I think I'll end with Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau from his Wildflower Journals. This is from July 21st, 1853. I went in pursuit of boys who had stolen my boat seat to Fairhaven. There is no more beautiful part of the river than the entrance to this pond. Nature is beautiful only as a place where life is to be lived. It is not beautiful to them who have not resolved on a beautiful life. I love that he had to deal with these boys who stole his boat seat, right? Like, it's like we get this idea that these people would just have no problems. And, you know, it's like, it's great. He had to go set a boundary, right? It's just like, not just looking at the flowers. I went in pursuit of boys who had stolen my boat seat to Fairhaven. But yet, there's no more beautiful part of the river than the entrance to this pond. He had a choice. 
he could be doing that trip to find the boys with a lot of aversion, but no, nature is beautiful only as a place where life is to be lived and implying that this is not where the boys are living. It is not beautiful to them who have not resolved on a beautiful life. That's the spiritual home. We still have to take care of our, the seat in our boat <laughs> as we paddle through life, but it can be beautiful, spiritually beautiful. Any questions about the instructions or your practice talk? Kristen, <clears throat> hi. Can't hear. Well, thank you, as always. And one of the great benefits of the COVID, which there are a handful, is to um, be able to be with all of you on these Sunday evenings. And I just wanted to share an experience, a couple experiences I've had um, and just get your sense of them. Um, I, I've been learning over and over what you and all of you have been saying about being with being with what is and it sinks in on uh, different levels uh two years ago <clears throat> i uh, i had a uh, developed a heart problem and i also had an anaphylactic uh allergic response and was in the ER and, you know, getting all kinds of drugs. And I felt this, this um, pressure into my head. And I thought to myself, what if I'm gonna die? And, you know, the answer came back, so what? And, you know, I had this very spacious feeling and I kind of, I didn't leave my body, but uh, it was, it was very peaceful. And afterwards, you know, I called all my friends and, and I was very identified with being peaceful. It's like now I, I think I got this, uh, you know, being with death thing. And then a year ago, um, you know, my 
heart rate just went berserk, you know, like 170. And, and it was just pounding out of my chest. And I thought my head was going to explode. And I mean, I, I thought right then and there I was going to die. And I had a sense of stark terror. It was just, I, and I didn't know how to be with it other than to feel it. And um, so I, it was the only time I'd ever called 911 for myself. And then I became very identified with having failed at being peaceful with death. And so it's like, I'm, I'm really grateful that I've had those two experiences because I realize I have to be with however I am, you know, basically every moment, but particularly with, with death. Um, so I just like to thank you for all of you, for your, you know, for your teachings over these last two and a half years. But Kristen, that's so beautiful. It's like, I think our ultimate human our arrogance is that we think we can control how we're going to be at death, right? Like, it's like we have this idea it should be a certain way. My dad really taught me that it it's not going to be <laughs> how, you know, you might want it to be. You know, he had a wild death. Um, but um, I think that that's important. It's important to be able to get that that's what we're doing every moment. We're actually learning how to die every moment. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's the key to this, this whole thing is that, that choice, we think we want to be peaceful, but actually we can be peaceful with the terror. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the ticket. Christian, that's it. And, and to not have an idea, it should be this way. It's always the awareness of what's happening, which is a kind of death. It's like a kind of, it's a death of the little ego. It's the death of the little me to what's really happening, which includes everything. <laughs> wow. I don't know, Steve, do you have anything to add? Well, I can't hear you, but I, I just also just to add in just that attachment, that attachment, it, we, I already said it, but just to add in that, that other angle to it, that we can be attached to peace, thinking that that excludes fear or sadness or grief or like that, that peace, peace doesn't exclude exclude anything it's only attachment that excludes everything i'll just add that those two moments you mentioned the, the peaceful one and then later the terror one. Those are powerful meditation um, proximate causes for awareness. That is, if you recollect them when you're sitting, like even now, we don't know when our last in-breath is. We don't know when our last out-breath will be. But we're, we're pretty certain that there will be one. So to have those reflections and then, you know, have a breath mm -hmm. and... Not to dwell or overdwell, but just knowing that some of our breaths have that peaceful nature, contentment with awareness, and, and some are more disturbing. 
you know, frightening. And then, but they, they both pass. They both come and they both pass. So I think it's a, I think it's a powerful, like, bookends for practice. Dear Ulamin, wherever he is now, I don't know, taught us, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, that, that uh, a practice that I use a lot, and that, that notion, death can, it's, it's a traditional practice, but I'm, I'm butchering the words, but the idea is okay. Um, death can come at any time from any, dis, from any disease, from anywhere, we don't know the moment, you know, Life is uncertain, only death is certain. And somehow, just doing it right then, uh, it's so freeing. It's so freeing. It just puts it right here. Uh, sweet man. Oh, anyway, that's a sign. I think that's, it's like the truth, Harry, you know, that's what's so moving. The truth is, the truth is so powerful. <laughs> Death is certain. No matter how much we keep thinking with the next breath that it's not going to happen yet. <laughs> we don't, that's what's so funny about it. We don't know, you know. The, the um, poet Galway Canal also has in the Book of Nightmares one of his poems, um, the, wages, the wages of dying is love. <laughs> the wages of dying is love, meaning how can, how can we go through more, this everyone, all beings, not just humans, the mortality, it's like what we all share is our vulnerability to our mortality and uh, all the ways we're trying to defend instead of just be with it. Um, how can we do that without loving kindness, compassion, mudita, equanimity? In, 2000, in 2005, um, I don't know if I'm still on, yeah, in 2005, uh, I almost died from a, a strange infection in the peritoneum, and uh, they were ruling out things like uh, pancreatic cancer and the like. And I was like, it's been a rich life, it's okay. And then when they moved it out and they said it was just something that can be surgically removed, I was really happy because I wanted to live some more. It was like both sides of that were okay. It was a somewhat rare moment of equanimity, I think. But... Yeah, I think sometimes in the hospital we get these great moments, you know. It's so... Um... The, the fire, the, you know, we're cooking. We're cooking if we're, if we're in the hospital. <laughs> the fire is under us and... It's great to hear, Harry. It's great. It's heartening. You get grateful for being alive. Look, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you disappeared for a moment. <laughs> Death and rebirth. Right, right there. <laughs> it's, your chair disappears sometimes, too. I don't know if everybody's seeing it, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> Kirsten. Oh, 
and Steve, it's really good to see you. I haven't seen you since 1999 <laughs> in, the, in the three month retreat. <laughs> wow. And, uh, Michelle, you once told me, you said, Kristen, you're an open type. Don't try so hard. <laughs> <laughs> so I've taken that to heart. And I, and this is my question. Um, and this is a very, uh, it's actually a, a quite vulnerable asking the question. Um, is your father and my father something very similar? And my father is aging, you know, um, he's, oh, he's having a family reunion this summer and I decided not to go because the cost to me was so profound. And I struggle with this so much because I don't struggle with loving kindness or metta or even equanimity with my family, but, but energetically the cost in that moment, I think about this moment where, you know, you, the cost was getting really great for you <laughs> and you know you you know you lost it with your father <laughs> and i i haven't lost it with my father in a very long time but i lose it internally and i get so exhausted and so tired from interacting with certain like kind of like toxic systems that even seem to get stronger even as i gain more equanimity and loving kindness and so I just, I guess I'm just asking that question, like as an open type, as like somebody who's just like, wow, I'm trying really hard. But then sometimes I just, I can't, I can't do more than I can do. And I, it's like, it, it, it literally is, it's shredding me because of course I want to have those last moments, right? That, that moment where you, you you showed up at the graveyard, even though it was hard, and two weeks later your father's gone, and I two guess months, yeah, two months, yeah, two months, yeah. yeah. So I guess asking the question like that: How do I walk that razor's edge of showing up, not just not just having loving kindness, but showing up, but then also having loving kindness and compassion for myself? It is. For me, that's the last frontier. So if you have any insight on that, I would love to hear it. <laughs> mm. Well, Steve, I can start, but I'm sure, do you want me to start? Yeah. Are you, sure. I don't know. It's, um, I mean, to be very vulnerable and open in return, um, I'm not sure if it was a half a year before the graveyard disaster or like maybe a few months before that but um i have a childhood friend i knew her since i was one and a half years old um, but i hadn't heard or seen from her for maybe 30 years maybe no probably it was probably um 15 years or something i'd seen her briefly um, but it didn't wasn't very much in touch with her and she called me out of the blue she'd never called me in my you know life since after i left home and uh she said i'm just saying she was a little drunk but she said i'm just saying if there was ever a time you were gonna come home and help your father now is the time to do it and then she hung up <laughs> like oh my god it was such a awful shock and like not a discussion and it, it had judgment in it like when when the hell are you going to come home and help out and um i did a very honest self-assessment like it was very painful and i i knew my older sister was the favorite he was very good to her he was very hostile to me i knew that coming back then at that point wasn't going to be um okay for either of us and uh it was very hard and then um when my father did fall i i would i was willing to visit but not move there and take care of him yet and uh when my dad fell and was in the hospital uh, there was a certain point where the family was around but then they never you know they left uh, and i was there for two months uh, for with the hospital thing, but there was a point where they they all went out to the hospital um, cafeteria, and my father thought I was going to leave too, and he said, 
<laughs> it's the first time in his life like he's stuck there he's stuck there with me he's stuck there he can't leave my father was always into leaving and he was stuck there and he said oh don't worry about me I'm not going anywhere and I, I thought and I said uh, yeah dad you're stuck with me you know it's like I'm in charge <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to put up with me until this is over and it was great it was like I knew I could do it I knew I could do it at that point when he had no power left like he was stuck in the hospital in the bed and he knew it he's like he said it first he said I'm not going anywhere don't worry about me and I'm like well I am worried about you but here we are and I could do that and a lot of people gave me a hard time for doing that. They said well, he was so he was so hard on you. How can you do that the, the last two months of his life? And I said he gave. If if I'm alive and he did a lot for me, he was hard. But um, I I have the ethics to do this. This is what I can do. I can take care of him, and I did. And so that's, I just want to say, I can't see your face because I have an iPad at this point, but um, you have to be willing to say no, like when it's not the right time. You did it, the family reunion, it wasn't right. It might be that you can come go and have lunch or like you have to kind of see where can you be there and when, where can you not? Because it's not going to help your dad if you're overwhelmed. It's just, it's not, it's not going to help. You have to, or you can be there for a little bit, get overwhelmed, and then recover and heal. But I was at the point when that happened that I could do it. It was hard, but I did it. And I have many funny stories about it. <laughs> oh, so bad they're funny. So that's what I have to say, Steve. What do you have to Long answer. Well, I heard you, Kirsten, describe a beautiful practice process. And that is uh, the teaching that is um, connected to mindfulness, you know, like a train car connected to the locomotive, clear comprehension. And clear comprehension is doing exactly what you describe, considering what your capabilities and limitations are, what your intention or purpose is, and that, and, but intimately connected to that, is this the right time for something significant or important? So the timing, the sense of purpose and the sense of timing, and then just really seeing and feeling the power and expansiveness of knowing our capabilities and limitations in any particular moment. Our teacher Upandita emphasized that again and again, just in the simplicity of, our, of a day of practice, knowing energetically what we were capable of, sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, resting. And when we have the capability, the right amount of, of output of energy and is the wisdom there to self-regulate, modulate, pull back, step forward. That's what I heard you describe and I thought it was exceptionally beautiful and powerful. Thank you both so much. It's so humbling, right? <laughs> so humbling to think that you can do it right and you know we just can do what we can do. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome, and thank you. Yeah. Our parents are deep karma. Yeah. Very deep.
it, I just want to add again, it's like with parents, like for me, my father had done many good things for me too. It was just a, a hostile, hostile, he was very hostile. And so I wanted to honor that in the way I could, but there's no perfect way to do that. And, and not coming when my friend said to come was very pain, was very hard, but I knew it was the right thing. Like when Steve says clear comprehension of purpose, I knew that was right, right? But it was, it didn't look good from the outside. <laughs> the, the wisdom that you're, that I'm getting today is so similar to the wisdom that I got, you know, 20 some years ago, which is like, maybe it's not what I think it is. <laughs> and you know, yeah yeah and like trust self-trust and sometimes trust like whatever the thing is and yeah to back away from the thing that might be like something that looks like force mm. yeah mm. yeah it's like our practice again and again where our intent is that understanding deepens with the same phenomena, impermanence, and the unsatisfactory nature of things because they're impermanent. There's nothing to hold on to. So we could say unreliability or insecurity. And thirdly, that inability to control things because there's no controlling agency. There's no one who can control, make things happen or not happen. It's the same truths that we see momentarily every time we're meditating and just having a more fulfilled or more mature insight every time to those things. So when we apply the clear comprehension to our daily life practice, purpose and the right timing, that that's like a, a navigating force for how we go through and, and do things, or the non-doing that's also often far more important than trying to do something but maybe with the wrong intention or the wrong timing. Just to be, just to fill out the, the, the Dhamma of that, there are, in the clear comprehension, there's, there's four areas to clearly comprehend. And one is sense of purpose. What, what we want to do, or what the intention is, to understand and kind of be fully present for that purpose, sense of purpose. The second is um, really the adaptability skill to know the timing. Is this the right time or is this the right moment? Or should I say this? Should I be silent? Should I go there? Should I not go? And thirdly is to know the domain of our practice, which is everything. There's, there's nothing outside of our, our pastures of meditation, the body, feelings, heart, and all the sense phenomena that we experience. And the fourth of the clear, of the clear comprehensions is to know when there's wisdom and to know when there's delusion. So the clear comprehension of the presence or absence of intuitive understanding. Well, 
how does one know the difference? <laughs> and I and I ask that not from like a place of like I'm asking that from a very profound place because can you ask that? Can you say that again? I missed the first part. How does one know the difference truly between wisdom and delusion? Because sometimes I find that actually intuition is just as deluded as thought. And so does it make sense? It all makes sense. Yeah. And, and yes. Wisdom knows. Wisdom knows. Yes. Wisdom knows. Yes. Wisdom knows. And are you saying that over time and with practice that the trust and wisdom becomes the the taproot for exactly the force of action okay right they're, in, they're inseparable okay got you okay the confidence and the wisdom got you the trust oh. and and the intuitive oh. understanding okay they're they're a unit and they they evolve sometimes there's more confidence sometimes less and sometimes the wisdom is more intellectual and sometimes it's more that liberating intuitive knowing would you say that is one purpose of of like having a relationship with a teacher to help you understand the difference between delusion and wisdom of course okay yeah. okay <laughs> okay yeah. yeah that's our job <laughs> <laughs> Always hardest with oneself. <laughs> that, that, was, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that, Kirsten. Yeah. And everyone today, yeah, great. Harry, Kristen, Kirsten, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Just a quick note on that. On that note, um, <laughs> a reminder that Darine is offering on Mondays to to have sign up interviews with anyone, you know, of our students who's interested in kind of working with your practice more in your daily life setting. You know, we know we do interviews with you when you're on retreat with us in a formal way, but um, she's offering that. So I'll put the link there again. It came out in an email a few weeks ago, but um, this Monday is all full. But you know, just if, if you ever think you wanna might want to take advantage of that opportunity, it's a pretty way to uh, do what Kirsten was mentioning. Better help you know if it's delusion or wisdom. <laughs> Have a good week. Yes. Mm. Filled with Brahma Vihara heart. Mm.